What's going on, brother? What's up? Big day. All right, we got we got a good one today. I'm just gonna get right into it. First off, I'm gonna tell Johnny. I gotta introduce you, bro. I know everybody knows who you are, but I'm gonna introduce you because I got the stats right here. I didn't realize I didn't realize you were this good. Take some time, okay? <laughs> All right, keep him going. Keep him going. 1968 Rookie of the Year, two-time NL MVP, led the league twice in homers, RBIs three times. 389 career homers. You stole 68 bases. What? Are you kidding me? That's 50 more than me right there. 25 in a row, Case. 25 in a row. <laughs> Come on, are you serious? Wow. Yeah. In All fact, right. I'm the only person to hit more than 20 home runs and have a perfect uh, percentage in uh, stolen bases in a season with more than 10. Wow. That is, that yeah. seriously oh, isn't. Add that. I don't know who Rich is doing, but I, you should have had that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had that. Yeah, no. <laughs> You're right. You you need to produce my shows from now on, Johnny. You need to produce my shows. Oh, oh gosh, you wouldn't do that to me. I, I got right. him. Yeah. Listen, I gotta finish this. Ten postseason homers, which is unbelievable. Ten gold gloves, fourteen time all star, two times World Series champ, World Series MVP. And I know Johnny's got way more stats in his head than I do, but let, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest catcher of all time. My man, my friend. Johnny Bench. Johnny, thanks for joining us, man. Oh, go for it, baby. Go for it. Go ahead, Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing these days, Johnny? Yeah, I know you got the kids. How are the kids? How's everything going? You're you're rolling being a single dad. What's going on? How is everything? Well, it's awesome, actually. The mother moved down here to Florida about a little year and a half ago, I guess. And, um, you know, we have week on, week off. Uh, boys are doing great. I just came back from Palm Springs where we used to live and uh, got to see their friends. And uh, we're headed up this Sunday uh, to Cincinnati because the College Catcher of the Year Award, the Johnny Bench College Catcher of the Year Award, is uh, in Cincinnati on Tuesday. And uh, Matt, Matt, uh, Matt won it. And so we're excited about that. But we've uh, increased it to do the women's softball catcher of the college catcher. And <clears throat> we're going to do a Reds country, what they call Reds country, which is Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, and Kentucky. I want to recognize the high school boys and girls catchers of the year. So that's happening. And then uh, Joe, Mor Joe uh, Morgan's Memorial on the 8th of August, uh, Red's Induction Hall of Fame, of which you will be there, of course, and then party, and then uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. So, you know, just, just enough stuff to get <laughs> on the road. I've been really quiet and doing it here, and uh, life was pretty good. It really is. It's great. As a matter of fact, they keep me young, and uh, I'm just a lucky man. I, you know what's great? It's it, it, I have I got some young kids too. I have a, I have a one one that's going to college. I have two in college, but I got two little girls too, 15 and 11. And I always find that like every morning, like making the lunches for the kids and like trying to get them some help, at least at least some reasonably healthy food. That drives me a little crazy because I got to get up early, get rolling, and get things going. Like. Do you find the same stress I do as far as getting the kids off to school? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you're, you're, you make coffee nervous. I mean, it's just like. You know, <laughs> it's up at 625, I fix their lunches before I get them up. And then and I get them omelets and cook omelets or pancakes or cereal, whatever they're hungry for that day, I alternate. And then we're off to school at 710. And then, uh, no, it's pretty pretty good routine. I, it's different for you because you've got a schedule with MLB. You're doing the stuff and you're traveling. And to try to get up, you know, sometimes it's like doing it. But, yeah, I think the hardest thing is, is trying to get them, you know, food that they eat. The cafeterias were closed this past year. They weren't real big on it anyway. I guess uh, I looked at the lunches. You know, you can buy the lunches and everything else. Turns out, you know, I have 47 bags of Doritos for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, so okay, great. You're, you know, one eats and one doesn't particularly. One particular. And the chicken tenders. And it's kind of expanding a little bit now, but Chick-fil-A, I should, I should have bought stock in that baby. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And you know what's funny about Chick-fil-A? My kids love Chick Fil A too, and whenever we go there, that drive through is packed. And I'm like, <laughs> is every drive through a Chick Fil A packed around the country? It's unbelievable. Everywhere, everywhere. There's back when they added the COVID thing, they knew, they had three lanes 
going around on the outside. And now you can actually go in a little bit, but three lanes going around and they are so efficient. They're so good. And I, you know, I, I said, you know, why, why doesn't Case and I have one of these franchises? <laughs> I have, all these kids are so nice when you go through and they thank you for coming and helping and all the stuff and everything else. I could see you out there, you know, greeting around. Hey, how you doing, everybody? <laughs> Let's get a, get a third nugget. Okay, how about that? Spicy chicken. Yeah, hold the tomato. <laughs> <laughs> well, PC, uh, Sean's not paying me for this, so maybe we can get a sponsor and you can put a couple bucks in my pocket. <laughs> Such is the, uh, you know, it's it's a startup job. You got to understand, startups are like this. If we yes. start, uh, which I I stay pretty active. I'm involved with a couple, a lot of different things. The Hope for the Warriors, and then we have the golf golf tournament over in uh, Fort Myers with Bobby Nichols, and we raised a million three last year that we can donate wow. to these women and children and the backpacks. Wow. I host a tournament here at the end of October for uh, at-risk kids who go to a, a special school. And uh, then, of course, the Johnny Bench Scholarship Fund, which we have about 84 kids on every year. And uh, a lot of it keeps me busy. And, and we're looking at new enterprises. I'm, I've really been involved with the brain and trying to do, uh, you know, concussions and neurovisual stuff that uh, we're expanding on all the time. And hopefully the hyperbaric chamber and uh hey i gotta i'll show you something here somehow this uh, gentleman uh 87 years old he was going to uh can i walk around with this is this all right oh yeah oh yeah you, you look, look great bro. So, so he's 87 years old and a lady who work, works as a nurse uh we had met up in in south dakota and she said this guy has all this collection are you interested in buttons and i said well you know and she shows me these baseball buttons so Wow. So uh, I said, yeah. And so. Wow. That's a lot of, that's so a lot of pin backs. They're called pin backs. Uh, so, yeah. But any, but what about the rest of the buttons? Well, I said, well, so I got a thousand Disney. I got a thousand uh, Snoopy. I got 150 uh, for uh, St. Patrick's Day. These are all movies. There's a Batman. If you need anything, old John Cullen up there in South Dakota. <laughs> storm. Hey, this is it. I'm, maybe I can sell online here. This might be the thing I'm doing. <laughs> These are all astronauts. And then wow. she said, he has patches. So these are all astronaut patches. Now I've got three boxes <laughs> and five albums in the garage. So you can what? imagine my ping pong table at one time <laughs> like this was so what i've done is i've put every one of them i've sorted all of them there's submarines if you want that if you want the heavy rescue i got that everything else so oh i've been through all of these here's uh security from ohio right there rocking technical i've got it baby i've got here's a, here's a gulp guess i'm getting everybody here's one for you i love that oh, oh you have a little playboy <laughs> how about this one Oh, we got Pac a Pac-Man. Pac We've Pac all done this. New York City Chief Medical Examiner, 1959. Well, so so I'm sorting through all of this. I'm just, I, you know, I go through them. I go through them. Then I got medals and badges and pins. And so you ask me what I'm doing? Well, <laughs> so are you going <laughs> to... Dude, you're like the busiest guy I know. Like you're saying like, oh yeah, I just get the kids off the school. No, you don't. You got freaking 95 charities. You got uh, you got more buttons and pins than I've ever seen in the freaking history of the world. Are you gonna yeah. start seriously? Are you gonna start a Johnny Bench buttons and pins company? Like seriously? I'm trying to figure this out, but I don't know the values. So how do you find out the values? And uh, how do you find out what they're worth? And then how do you individually, or do you sell them as a as a as you know? I don't know what Rich is into, but I think now we got maybe a buyer. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking it up now. Somebody's got to know. Somebody's got to know. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, hey, Johnny, getting off the buttons and pins for a second, just to see, did you watch the All-Star game last night? And and I guess the, uh, on top of that is, what what is your take on Shohei Otani? Uh, just, he's a dream. Absolute yeah. dream. I mean, every close-up, every smile, he was smiling, he was working hard he wanted to do that I, it was it's such a, a such a refreshing thing I mean to see 
see the talent. And, you know, Case, we hear about guys. We hear about guys all the time saying, you know, they're going to be this great and that great and everything else. And I'm thinking, how do they do that? I mean, you know, okay, there's, you know, there's skills and everything else. And I guess, you know, all the stat cast and analytics, which I don't really understand all of it. But, you know, but he was a dream. And to see the fun that was being had at that All-Star game. You know, before it was like you went to the All-Star game and you had to go to the luncheon and had to go to there. And then you had to try to figure out how to get home by, by you know, Wednesday afternoon, take the, you know, earliest flight out so you get home so you could work out so you could play the game on Thursday. And you're the National League president in 1968, Warren Giles. I mean, he came in and just absolutely said, we do not lose. We do not lose or you will not be back. I mean, sort of like that kind of situation where you're picking out you know, you get they had a, a table, so you could go down the table and you could pick out mugs or <clears throat> platters or whatever and different mementos for that particular game. And because you're in there, you get that choice. And so he said, "What do you think you're going to get?" And I said, ah, "I think I'll get the mugs. I'll get that other stuff later." <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. I was awful to think I said that. It was like, "Well, I'll be back." I mean, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Uh, so, do you, uh, it was uh, it's such a you know the being and of course it was different for us in those days because like somebody wrote in the about the the fifty uh, nineteen seventy one game in Detroit you know it was like going back through your baseball cards it's like going back through your history and memory these guys I, I don't know, I'm not sure how much a lot of them know the history of the game and who the who they are and whatever but you know Griffey's there Junior he's uh, you know presenting the home run. It's, it was really cool. It was really a fun, enjoyable time for me. Are, are you, yeah. like, your generation, they talk about being, you know, the toughest and, and you know, would murder each other, murder, murder the opposing team if you had to. What do you feel about when, you know, like, guys are hitting home runs and they're getting high fives from the opposing shortstop around in the bases in these games? You're, you're cool with that? Well, that's the all-star game, but it's almost like a regular game, Rich. I'm telling you, it's just like that. But, you know. <laughs> It's like the hugs and the whole things. I mean, we had a really, I mean, you got, we got a $50 fine wow. if you fraternized. Wow. If you would talk to another guy on the other team, it was $50 because, you know, you just hated the other team. Now, because of free agency and because all these guys play together and there, there's so many Latins that have absolutely taken over the game, unbelievable, talented kids. And they've all played it, grew up with each other. They're all buddies. And so they don't, you know, they really don't, have any you know problem but they are going to try to hit that pitcher as hard as they can they are going to steal your base hit they wonder where the you know the averages have gone well look at these guys these are like you know Barishnikov. every one of them can go get the ball jump over fences they run and dive they get the highlights i mean so there's 20 points right there and you know case and iris we, we relied on our speed we had a lot of infield <laughs> <laughs> hey, Johnny, I re Johnny, my first All-Star game in, in 1999, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm 25. It's at Fenway Park. You were there with the All-Central team. I think that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm, in, the, um, I'm in the trainer room. It's Luis Gonzalez, Mark McGuire, Jeff Bagwell, and Tony Gwynn. And I, at the time, I was leading the league in hits. And Luis Gonzalez turns to me. He's like, Case, how many hits do you have? I go, 127. He goes, how many infield hits? I said, zero. He goes, now that's raking. That is rich when you have no infield hits, you know what I mean? Johnny, wait a minute, 14... wait, 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 wait. What? what were you doing in the training room? <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. I was just getting taped up. I was just getting taped up. What? What were you taping? <laughs> it's my wrist. My wrist. <laughs> hey, talk about that, Johnny, because I remember when you used to come in the clubhouse and, you know, you used to be like, Hey, stay out of the training room. And I'm like, well, what do you do? That's like, rub some, you said, this is what you said, rub some dirt on it. Just rub some dirt on it. I was like, is that what you, you can guys only did find back excuses. in the day? Yeah, well, you can only find excuses in the training room. I love these guys. You know, we had a guy who was the outfielder. I won't mention his name, but he was an outfielder, switch hitter. Just most athletic, looked like a base, just looked like one, you know, the model and GQ and everything else. He was in the major leagues 12 years. He spent six years on the disabled list. So, I mean, it's like you go in there and I can find an excuse. Oh, I got a little twinge here. You know what? I I caught 54 days in a row in 1968 without a day off. Wow. And so, 
and I oh. hurt. I was the last one off the plane. My back was horrible because of the car wreck. But um, I just, uh, you, you can always find an excuse. And these guys are always saying, well, you know, if I hadn't been on the disabled list and you rated my prorated my uh, stats, I would have probably hit 190 RBIs and yeah. 78 home runs. And, and, of course, that's the agent using that. But, uh, no, it, uh, the All-Star game is, is special. You're, in 1999, it was special for you, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, your memories, I, I'm sure you might have talked about them, but maybe not to your audience. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, you know what? Yeah, I haven't really talked a ton about the All-Star games, but, like, the, the, the memories I have are unbelievable. I mean, some, just on, on when you guys were on the field there, one of the coolest memories I ever have from the All-Star game was when Ted Williams came out and and we were we were walking up and obviously you were there too at the all century team walking up I me mean, no, I'm looking out oh you I weren't was, there I was oh, playing you... golf in Scotland <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> they said can you make it were you there when they had it in uh in Atlanta and uh a few years well that next year next two years oh you didn't make it the next year oh <laughs> <laughs> I just know I just know I'll, I just know I'll get to see you in the clubhouse. I don't even have to worry about the 99 All-Star game, you know? But when yeah. we were, when I was walking up to see Ted Williams, one of the coolest <clears throat> moments I had, George Brett puts his hand on my shoulder. He's like, "Hey man, I just want to introduce myself. I'm George Brett." And I was just like, "I'm 25 years old. I'm like, ah, what the hell am I doing here? I can't believe it. you know, there's Ted Williams, there's George Brett, there's Willie Mays, there's Hank Aaron." Like, it was mind-boggling. So, yeah. there's so many great memories at All-Star games, but Johnny, 14 All-Star games for you, man. Like what was the coolest memory you had looking back at your All-Star games? Well, in 1968, my, I was 20 years old. I was sitting in my locker in the Astrodome, and I was not going to step out of the locker because I wasn't going to spike any of those guys. I didn't want, you know, what the hell, I'm a kid. I got picked as an extra catcher and everything else. And uh, Willie Mays is sitting straight across the locker room. And he walked straight across to me, and he said, you should have been the starting catcher and went back to his locker. And I said, that's that's all I need. That's all I ever need. And then I, I caught the ninth inning of that ball game. They were, didn't want to put me in. Red Sheen, they said, well, we don't have any other catchers. And the other guy, other coaches saying, he's not going to get hurt. Put him in there. So <laughs> I caught the last inning of the ball game, and I didn't get to hit. And then the first at bat in Washington the next year, I uh, took Mel Stottlemyre deep, uh, hung me a slider. And uh, so. What, what was that like? Because Vlad, Vlad Jr. in the All-Star game this year, homered and he was the second youngest player to ever do it you were the youngest so what was that like hitting that home run off Stoudemire in that game rounding the bases well first of all you have to understand there's a lot of things that went along this is I was actually on uh, my two-week uh, uh, summer camp for the army I was in the army reserve so I was at AP Hill Virginia serving my two weeks and so they gave me special permission to come to Washington so I go to the White House I meet the president Nixon and we do the whole thing then there's a deluge. It's like five inches of rain, and the game was canceled. And I'm thinking, oh, man, they're not going to give me another day off. I said, maybe I'll ask the president. Can you make an exception <laughs> to this? So anyway, they let me come back the next day. And, uh, you know, all I knew was that – and then I hit a ball in the in the last inning, or in my last next third at bat, that Yastrzemski jumped over the fence and caught. That would have been a home run. So wow. McCovey hit two home runs in that game. He was the MVP, so – I thought it was, you know, I never, I would have loved to have been the MVP of an all-star game, but it was, and then of course I left right after the game, went straight back to AP Hill and got in uniform there, a different uniform. And then I served my two weeks and then I joined the team again. Wow. Wow. That, that, that is, that is, that, that's unbelievable. That's, that would never happen nowadays, but that's unbelievable, you know, for you guys that that was even part of it back in the day. Um, yeah. Hey, I want to, I want to, we got something special for you, Chance. You want to roll this little clip right here? Because I had no yeah. idea Johnny Bench was this, was this cool? But now I know. <laughs> go ahead, Chance. <laughs> here we go. You're go funny. Ahead, <laughs> this man is the most valuable player of the 1976 World Series. I think he'll be the most valuable player ever. Mr. Johnny Bench. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Johnny Bench. And here he is, the catcher for the Cincinnati Reds, Mr. Johnny Bench, right now. Hall of Famer Johnny Bench. Thank you, Dizzy Dean. <laughs> 
think of this one here? Feel that. It's cute. What's it going to be when it grows up? Jessica. Hey, how are you? Nick uh, was so excited for you to come on our show. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. My son Bobby and I are big fans of both of you. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. You're the bigger back, didn't you? Do it. You know, Joe's yeah, side. Yeah. All right, so I haven't got a big muscle, but look at that chest. Look at that chest. Gee, I'm sorry about that, Bob. How did it happen? Johnny <laughs> Bench, my friend, hit two home runs in the World Series against the Yankees. Johnny, I have a message for you from the people in New York. Can we see it again, Johnny? I don't know if we yeah, got it yet. Yeah, yeah. Just, just let your hips explode and drive through the ball. <laughs> to quote one person who probably made catching more important outside of Roy Campanella, a guy by the name of Yogi Berra said, it's not over till it's over. Yogi, it's over. We have made it. And thank you very much. There you oh, go. my gosh. That, no, seriously. I had no idea you were that cool, Johnny. I just thought you were the greatest catcher of all time. I had no idea. Yeah, you, you, in, my age, in my age, I'm happy to see those things because I don't remember any of it. But at the same <laughs> point, I got to get a copy of that. You know, they don't show I'll me send on it the to Carson. You. Uh, they don't show me on Carson. They don't show me on the Jim Neighbors uh, show or the uh, Pat Sajak or uh, uh, who else? I And Merv Griffin. I got on a Merv Griffin one day and they brought up this, uh, they brought up this um, football pitcher. Uh, and it's November. I'm sitting on the couch, and they brought this girl in to be a softball pitcher. And she's the world softball champion, you know. And yeah. so I've got to, I've got to hit against her, you know. And she throws the first one. I miss it by a mile, and she started winding up. And I swung when she started winding up, and I hit one past her, so hard. And I put the <laughs> bat down and walked back. So that's all I got, baby. That's all I got. <laughs> that's so great. Well, what, what, like I, I when I look when I looked back and when I was looking at everything, like. You know, you think of guys like Jordan and Jeter and Tom Brady and stuff like you were that in that in the in your era in your prime. Like, what was that like for you off the field? I mean, having that obviously would be one of the best players on the field at the time. But but having that, you know, living that star life kind of off the field, what was that like for you? Well, I mean, I was making eleven thousand dollars my first year, so it was like I had to do something. You know, I didn't. I was back in Binger after my. Uh, and I refereed basketball games, uh, $15 a game, I think I got in for refereeing basketball games. So I, I, I was not afraid to stand up. I did my 4-H when I was in school, and I learned to speak, and I learned to – so I, I started working for the Red Speaker Bureau, and I would go out and spoke, you know, speak to the, to the sewing bee or a quilting bee and everybody in Cincinnati. And so I learned what people kind of liked and what they wanted, and then I started doing motivational speeches. And then when I was on with Bob Hope, then it became people who really recognized that I would sing, I would, I was, I could converse, I could tell stories, and I could tell about my hometown, and I could tell funny things that people really enjoyed. And so I got into the speaking, and I started the what I call the vowels of success, the A E I O U's of life. Wow. And then I wrote a book about because people ask me, my kid wants to be a catcher, what do I tell them? And I say, catch every ball. And so I <laughs> equated that over to. Well, if if you can catch every ball that's thrown your way, then they're going to say, wow, what a great catcher. And then I said, it's like this in business. I mean, we are great, but you don't you have rich to be your production manager. You've got all that stuff because we're not capable of doing that. There is no I in team, but it's all eyes. You better have the best individual at each position. So you've got Richie running the board, doing all the stuff and everything else, hooking you up with this with this no filter. And it's you got to have people to do that. And so then I started going, then it was Carson, and then it was, uh, you know, uh, all of these shows uh, that I could go on. And I would, I could, I wasn't embarrassed. I knew the words. I could sort of carry a tune. I sang with a symphony later on. And, but I was not a, afraid to do it. And it was my vehicle. I was making more money <laughs> speaking than I was playing ball. You know, what would I do with 30 million a year now, Case? I mean, oh ask me. tell me, 
tell well, me. What would you do? What would you do? Tell you that. I would. Well, I need the publicity. That's the only thing I'm on. This is all for the publicity with you, buddy. This is about getting me and selling pens and patches. You think I came on? Just to hang with you, <laughs> one of my favorite guys in life. I, oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god you're yeah. the greatest. That is is it, so you funny. know, I made two point two. I made two point two million in my entire career. They make that in two weeks. But oh hey, gosh. they they haven't been as successful in so many ways, and have as much fun, and and yeah. have so many friends across the country, and the things I do, and I played, I played nine senior tour events. I bowled professionally. I used to play tennis once a year, whether I liked it or not. So <laughs> I'm just all, all <laughs> my lawyer made me play. I hated it. I go back in. Johnny, what do you what do you think about that? Like as far as as far as like I remember talking to Ken Griffey Sr. and he said, I made more money going back to Denora and the steel mills, obviously before the union was formed. You know, he made more money in the off season than he did during the season. Um, like like for you, like did you see that a lot, a lot with guys? Was in your generation? Did you find that guys had to do had to work a lot in the off season just to pay the bills? Oh sure, car salesmen they did a lot of different things, and you know what you look at case is the fact that you know Jack Billingham won 19 games back to back, and I don't know how much he ever made, but today he wins 19 games in two years. He's making 25, 30 million a year, and those are the guys that you think you know. A lot of these guys never had the skills or the opportunity or wanted to go beyond that. They wanted to go back to their home and they wanted to do it. And that's why I made myself sort of my own corporation to be able to do this stuff. And, and there's a lot of guys that suffer because they don't they don't make the kind of money and they don't have the money to survive. I mean, two million dollars, you know, and starting in 1968, there's not going to be two million dollars left around. You're going to have to find something else to do. So you got to take it within yourself. And I, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, I, so many of my guys and so many of our friends have worked their butts off and I'm proud of them because they, they're not afraid to, but it's, it's hard. And I chose, I, I, I'm not sure. Let me, uh, I'm seriously, because did you si decide to retire or were you released uh, from baseball? I decided to retire my last year in Boston. I just was ready to be done. Cause you couldn't be Sean Casey anymore. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's a level that you do. I was, I right. was playing along. I wasn't Johnny Bench. I wasn't earning that money that I was being paid. And it was the decision. Now there's so many guys out there that don't make that decision. They are released. They're let go. They're, you know, they're down the road and they always have this thing in the back of their mind that they can still play. And they still want to prove to everybody they can still play. And it's hard for them to reach out and them go back in their mind and say, you know what? I need to find a job. I got to do something. What can I do? Or are they ever prepared for that? I grew up. I knew I was going to play professional baseball. Then I was going to do something afterwards, whatever it took to be successful. So it's still an attitude. That's the number one thing for my A is you've got to have an attitude. I mean, you woke up this yeah. morning with an attitude. <laughs> you always have a great attitude. Or somebody woke up next to you with an attitude. <laughs> so when people say, how are you doing? With that? <laughs> and I said, you know, people ask me, how are you doing? I said, I'm awesome. And they kind of, yeah. wow, I said, they don't really care how I'm, you know, so much about what I'm doing. But if my attitude is I am awesome, then I'm probably going to have a good day. Yeah. Ooh, like and that. I'm going to make somebody else's day if I can, because I have so many friends. And as, as we age, we get, you know, friends that we start to lose. We lost so many of our great players this year, but I lost three really, really super, super wonderful dear friends. It's hard, but you have to understand that we got to feel how lucky we are are to have those people in our lives for that long to be a part of who we are and what we are so I, i'm glad that you've made that decision and and you've made something out of it you've got the energy the effort the personality to go on mlb and and to you know to go along with some of those chatter boxes that you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but i like so to i think the last show you actually the last show you actually actually retorted back it wasn't like oh, yeah, yeah, no, okay, you're good. No, 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 hell no, it ain't right. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey, I put my inner my inner Johnny Bench. I was like, that's not right, and I'm gonna say something about it. Okay, I'm Why not. not? Gonna, I'm not gonna just sit here. Are you kidding me? Well, yeah, they ramble on like I've got you know I've got the answers and <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not Mister Obvious, okay? I just gotta tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> so good, so good.
so good. Hey, Johnny, one one thing. Uh, obviously, this is like how the sausage is made. Technical difficulties. If you hit the video button in your in your corner, can you hit the the video button on your iPad? And see if you pop back up. Because can you see I, me? Oh, uh, oh yeah, I can see you. But I you after you turn the video on, and I thought, oh, they're not going to show any more of him. Uh, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> there you. Wait, no. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh. There it says cameras on. There, there we go. go. Beautiful. Yeah, Johnny. Johnny. Oh, yeah. great. Somebody must. Somebody must have said that in your ear because there's no way you understood that. <laughs> <laughs> we do sign language. Here. Wait, now that I got you you're back text, on camera, and I have you're to tech actually, savvy. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that? to ask this one question. So you're talking about going back into the clubhouses and stuff, and Mr. Bench, you and your guys, Joe Morgan, what always. Is this Mr. Crap, I appreciate it. Name's yeah, yeah. Johnny. Okay, oh, you got it. <laughs> okay, All right. Uh, thank you, though, Rich. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me when you say that. Um, so, you guys, you, Mr. Morgan, Joe Morgan, you all have your suits on. You're always looking good, whatever. Casey's 90s teams, between, like, him, Dunn, they all look like Duck Dynasty. Like, so when you guys went in the clubhouse and saw these guys in a different generation, were you like, wow, what are they all about? I learned a long time. Uh, you only have one time to make a first impression, and uh, you know it only costs a few pennies more to go first class. So, <laughs> but you know when 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 you're making eleven thousand, you're trying to do anything you can to get notes. When you're making as much money as Case is, you know I don't have to. Deal. I don't deal with those trivial guys. You know these are guys. You know what? Who are they? I'm like, don't they know who I am? I mean, he's got leather couches. I got freaking. I got a. I got a freaking chair here. I bought in 1912. You know, he'll get something new here. <laughs> so oh, good. Uh, all right, now I want to switch gears because listen, when I get Johnny Bench on my show, I got to talk hitting because you're one of the best hitters ever, especially at that position, having to catch every day. I know how tough that is. I want to go back to when a bat. Um, against Dave Justy was that 1971, I believe. Uh, it was 72. Okay, it's 1972. Thanks for doing my research again. Um, and 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 you and you you came up. It was three two game. Justy was nasty. It, it was tough to get something going against him. And you hit a home run to tie it to right center. And when I when I I you know we've talked hitting before, Johnny. And you always said, hey, listen, don't be afraid to pull the baseball. You know, when you hit that ball to right center, like, can you talk about what was Johnny Bench's approach at the plate and what were you trying to do, especially mentally? Well, let's go back to hitting. Uh, in 1967, I've been, I was such a pull hitter. I was ridiculous. It's, I could pull anybody anywhere. It didn't matter. Outside corner, I threw it. I pulled it, but that's the way I was. So they sent me to Puerto Rico to learn how to hit the right field. So I'm go down to the right field. I mean, anybody can hit 300. I'm no offense, but. <laughs> anyway, I, I so they, nobody they sent, me, they sent me to hit to learn to hit the right field. So I go to Puerto Rico. I'm in 337. I'm I'm third in the league or whatever in hitting. This is easy. This is not easy. I'm not trying to hit home runs, so I can go the other way and with a 200 pound, 200 well, 220 in your case, Judy. But I, anyway, so I so so a week before a week before uh, Christmas vacation, we had a sponsor that was a jeweler. And he came into the clubhouse. Now I'm I'm on a team in Puerto Rico, Senadores, Senadores, and on the team is is you know I'm playing with Roberto Clemente and Coco Laboy and, and and Pat Dobson and stuff. And so he comes in and says, "All right, for every home run you hit, you get a, a watch." And I said, "The hell, it's true right field." <laughs> <laughs> I hit five home runs in the next six games. I took two. Two watches home to my sister-in-law, one to my mother and murdered my sister, and I came back and kept a watch, and then I went back and hit the right field. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is real hard. Okay, I'm going to punch over the first base and hit, get a little base hit or a double, and then I'm going to run the second, and then oh now, I'm going to drive in a 1,000 runs, which, which I did in the 70s. In, in the 70s, I drove in a little more than a 1,000 runs. So yeah, he always would say, you know, you can hit 300. I said, you hit 300, I'll drive you in 100. I don't care. <laughs> there we go. That's oh awesome. my so god. So then when I when I retired over from I stopped catching and so I had to go to a different approach and I went to Charlie Lau's approach because I thought that George Brett was the best hitter I've ever seen. 
Mm. So I go to the Charlie Loud. I'm hitting 351 when I break my ankle, uh, sliding into second. They hit the cutout. So uh, I went. I hit in 311. And but hitting is um, obviously it's vision, it's eyes. You know, it's like any, you talk about golf and putting. Anytime the eyes move, anytime there's eye concentration, anytime there's focus, where do you start? I ask uh, <laughs> so many kids, where do they watch? Where do they look for the baseball? And they always say, well, up here. And I said, why? I said, why wouldn't you go in the motion? Why wouldn't you go through the whole motion of him flowing? So your brain gets to do it. In a 90 mile an hour fastball, you have 0.42 seconds from the time it leaves the pitcher's hand until it crosses home plate. You have 0.17 second reaction time. This is what we do with our neurovisual stuff. So we do the training. My vision at, when I was 19 years old was 25. And so I could, I could see everything and anything. So the identity, identifying the baseball, being able to send that signal, the cameras are the eyes. The eyes don't see. The cameras, the brain sees, sends the signals, and you're reacting. So I always had – I looked for pitches in certain places. I adjusted to people in certain places. And then, you know, after I had the lung surgery, I became a different, different player. But at the same time, uh, my idea was to try. And as I could stay back longer because I always preach try to pull the ball, at least one or two rounds in batting practice because – I wanted you to find out how long you could wait and still go get it and the waiting process and then being able to visual, visual, visually see the baseball and keep them on a level path. So that that was sort of the deal. And I grew up playing in the backyard with tin can and we hit knuckleballs, curveballs, sliders. And so all of that really helped, I think. Wow. Let's let's stay there for a second. Like talking about. Um, like visually, like you only struck out a hundred times twice, I think, in your whole career. Guys are punching out two hundred times nowadays, and I know your generation was big on, hey, listen, we gotta, we gotta find a way to put the ball in play. Did you have a two strike approach? Like, did you, did you spread out? Did you, you know, did, did you have a two strike approach, or was it like, hey, three big swings? I lowered my elbow. I lowered my back elbow. I, I brought it down just a little bit. I never had it up here. A lot of these guys up here have their arm up here, which means the plane's going down. And now, of course, it's the Ted Williams theory where you put, you know, they always, they say to me, what was your velo and your uh, and your <laughs> launch angle? I said, if it went over the fence, it was good launch angle. It was a good velo. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know else how to approach it. But uh, I think I think we were more, you know, move the runner over, get the stuff in. I love to hit and run. I love the whole idea of situation hitting man on third. My whole idea was Darren Johnson told me when I was eight, 19 years old, he said, anytime there's a runner on third, hit a fly ball to center field. That's, that's your attitude. So it's kept you in the middle of the field. I led the league in a, and sacrificed flies. So, I mean, I wanted to be up there with the runner on base. My focus was so much better and, and so much more acute in, in those situations. But uh, I, I, I have a thing called inner conceit. It's being better than the situation. When I went up to the plate, I was better than that pitcher. He couldn't get me out. He would. They couldn't steal on me, but they did. But it was still the idea that you had to have that belief and so you could actually slow the ball down and wait for whatever you were looking for and take advantage of it. I, lo- I actually <laughs> love that. Because that's that's- is, isn't that the truth? You know, it's a one. It's a. I always tell it's a one-on-one wrestler match. It's me versus you. Like it's time to get it on. I better believe in myself to the upteenth degree. You know, it, it, when when we're gonna battle. Um, you know, Johnny, what about what about your generation of guys? Like, did you did you guys talk mechanics and overthink mechanics? Because nowadays these players on the on the on the you know in the in the, right in the game on the flights on the bus rides, they have video to look at their swings. Was mechanics so big with you guys, or was it more about just competing? <laughs> Ted Klazuski, our hitting coach, says, get your hands started. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and I, I'm down here the other day, Case. I'm down here with the Olympic uh, team that's, that was trying to qualify. And I, yeah. I'm down there, and uh, and one of our guys was hitting, and, and he's, he's, you know, these guys are so big now and so up top. And remember this case, if you could play, if you played in the 50s, you could play now. If you played now, you could right. go back. Now, if you're at 170, your ass would never see the lineup. I'm going to tell you right now, you would be down in double A or class A or something like that until you learned how to do it and you earned the right to be there. But I'm out, I'm down there and I'm thinking, and I'm seeing, watching a guy said, 
can I can I say something? He said, sure. I said, get your hands started, would you? Get mm. your hands started. As soon as he starts with that, I said, now. And he started just powering. But it was like, you've got to get in there because I, I would go out and watch a batting practice on the other team to watch what their mechanics were. I, I there's, there's only two things. It's the front knee and the hands. Mm. If the front knee went forward, I pitched them all day because they had to be an upper body swinger and I could swing over top of curveballs and get the ground ball. Mm. And if they didn't start their hands, I knew they'd be late. And so the only time then was you never threw them a changeup because, mm. you know, if the changeup looked like a regular off speed fastball to them. So they, they were always hit. You never throw a bad hitter a, a changeup because their timing is on that. That's not on the other thing. So there were things that I did. We never talked about, we never had it. We, uh, and of course, the season was over, and uh, went refereed basketball games and did whatever. And then a month before the season, he started doing some wind sprints. And then, you know, I remember Lee May, the first world, first the spring training, showed up. He's got on one of those rubber suits, you know, to lose his <laughs> fifteen pounds. And it is the water is running down. He's out of his. He's walking, and this is just like your hose. He had a hose in there pulling it down the road because you had to wait. Now these guys are physical specimens. They're working out before the game, after the game, and everything else. I admire the hell out of them, but to to think you hit, you can hit 170 and 180, 190, and still have a job is still amazing to me, and they're, and they're in the lineup. But we forgive them if they hit a home run. They'll strike out three times, hit a home run. These are the greatest players. Let's get them, baby. Put to their end. <laughs> <laughs> and owners, you know, owners like it. They, they love it. They accept it. Fans accept it. Yeah. And, and so – uh, when when clubs accept it, then you know you strike out 150 times in the minor leagues, you're probably going to strike out 150 times in the major leagues or more. So yeah. they're saying, "Oh, it's okay, you're fine. Just keep striking out." I went to a game here in Abacoa in Jupiter the other day, and the first 15 hitters, three of them made contact. Oh my! God. Three of them. I'm like, wow, these got to be. I, I didn't even know I was Cy Young was pitching and Christy Mathis. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Gibson's on the mound. Oh my God, Bob's got him again tonight. Okay. <laughs> but so what, what now about, it's, uh, go. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, so what's your take? You know, you were there when they tried to move the mound, and pitchers were getting too much an advantage. And there's talk about that now. You know, get, the pitchers have too much an advantage. Let's uh, maybe move the, the the mound back more. Whatever. How do you how do you feel about that? Well, I've talked to every orthopedic surgeon in the world, and they said, yes, please, move the mound back. Because we will have every one of those. You're talking oh, yeah, about exactly. your, your sister will have uh, Tommy Jones. <laughs> yeah, let's move it back. And let's make the bases wider because we can't see them. And the base, a lot of these players can't find the base. And let's move the second base. Let's get it bigger by four inches so that instead of 3.1 to second base, it's 3.0. So we can start getting people with solar bases, although mm-hmm. nobody's dealing. Right, right, right. And but I can't believe that they're going to, you know, the hitting zone is where the ball's moving and everything else. And, and this, what is it, spider something? Spider, they got? Spider tack, the spider tack. Is that what it is? I, I've never yeah. heard of that. I mean, pine tar, they had pine tar rags, and the pitcher would grab the pine tar rag when he went to the mound, and so he could get a grip on the seams. Well, now there's no seams, and it's like throwing a cue ball. You know, how do you mm-hmm. get them to do that? But look, the technology and the ability for these young kids to learn how to pitch, their arms are brought up to a level. Now they start them out throwing hard. It's like teaching golf. You can teach straight, but you can't teach long. So they get these guys that throw 100 miles an hour, and then they change their grip, and then they let the ball move. And these guys, I mean, I don't think that Greg Maddox ever had spider, but he throws all that stuff in here, and how quickly can the ball spin, the rotation of the curveball? You know, a good curveball will spin nine times. A really good, good curveball will go 11, and a great curveball will spin 11, 13 times. Now, that was told to me by Sandy Koufax. So uh, that's <laughs> that's the tightness of how you can get on top of the ball and how you can, you know, and rip it. And so I don't see it so much on that. But if you're going to have tacky stuff on it, you're not going to be able to throw so much without with the push or the running and the sliders and other things. These are just quality athletes that have – that farther advanced in pitching. They've moved farther forward than hitters have. And the defense is uh, 20 points harder now. It's just harder to get, you know, you, and I would always tell people, I said, so you're in a slump. Okay. So let's forget about that. Let's go with this. We're going for the next hundred at bats. 
So we're not no, we're not any longer stuck on I've got to get 12 hits in a mm. row. I'm going oh, the next yeah. 100 100 at bats. I'm going to get 29 hits. I'm going to get 30 hits. Uh, you know, here's the difference. I got 27 hits. You got 30. Right. So you got three more hits. And so we're looking at you as a 300 hitter, me as a 268 hitter. And you're going to say, well, I couldn't have been that good. But when you say, okay, and in 600 at bats, you got 18 more hit. Right. Okay. So, right. so it, it's a whole way of looking at it. But when, you know, the situation comes up with a man on third and you can't get a guy in, uh, now I, that's, that's the real problem I have with that is guys will give up their soul, heart and soul to, to drive that run in some way, make contact. And, uh, um, that's my only only thing I have is uh, is hitting. Don't know that much about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, so great hearing this stuff. I want to go back to some of the guys. Obviously, it, it got you here, and and we look back at you played on the greatest team ever. I mean, n- not arguably. I I believe the greatest team ever was the Big Red Machine with you and Pete and Doggy. And, and Joe Morgan, and even like Concepcion and Griffey Sr., George Buck, you guys were loaded. Can you talk about that and the leadership? Like when I look back at the Big Red Machine, I say, oh, wait, you know, you see that a lot of, you know, a lot of lat- great players, are some of the best players are going to be Latino. You had Tony Perez, a Latino leader. You had Joe Morgan, a black leader on the team. You had you, you had Pete. Can you talk about that, what that meant back in the 70s to have that kind of leadership? Well, first of all, you have to give credit to the four of us first because we, we didn't have those egos. You know, we didn't have those things where, oh, oh, I'm this, I should get this, they should not get that. Or We were all friends. We were all respectful of each other. We loved each other. <clears throat> then it was a case of Sparky would a lot of times call people in. We'd call four of us in. He'd call all four of us in sometimes. And what about, what if we got Sean? I said, he's available, that'd be great. Why? First of all, we liked your talent. Second of all, you would fit in with the club. The second thing is they would call you in and say, what about Jack? No. No. There there are people that fit in. And individually, you had to have a guy coming off the bench. You had to have the Bill Plummers. You had to have the Doug Flins. You had to have guys that were there, mm-hmm. the Merv Rettmans and Terry Crowleys and the people that were so important. And, and you had to have the pitchers. And I had to be the one in charge of the pitchers and, and be, understand every one of their psyches and understand what I needed to do to get it out of them. My number one job of the game was to call a good game because I wanted to get the good thing. Mm. But you did. And it was amazing because Tony could handle all the Latin problems. Joe could handle all the black problems if he had any. And, and, but the, the, if he's a leader in the clubhouse. I don't give a rat's ass about the clubhouse. You're on time on the field. You don't miss buses. You don't miss planes. You don't have anybody waiting on you. You set the example by being out there and playing hard every day. And you encourage those guys behind you. You know, the genius of a situation is leaving behind a situation that a a person without the benefit of genius can still do the job. Barky called me in one day and said, Johnny, we got a chance of getting Phil Necro. What do you think? I said, I think you better trade for his catcher too. I'm not going back there. <laughs> but there were there actually were about two or three times that they went ahead and made a trade without uh, talking to us. And these people got on there and there was one a buffoon. He was he wanted to do the bubble gun on the hat. He wanted to do the hot foot. And we said, no, that that's not working here, pal. We don't mm. do that here. And he was gone in a couple of weeks. But there were guys oh, wow. that had to fit in. And, the, and once they got there, they found out that there was leadership and the fact that everybody was for you to begin with you. Clay Carroll was a run of the mill. I mean, he, he was in Atlanta. He, we called him Sonny Sunoco because every time he came in, he poured gas on the rally, man. They blew it up. And we got, and he came up there and we encouraged him. We expired him. We, we, we got his motivation so high and told him how great he was, how good he was. And I mean, he broke more bats than anybody in the Nas- national league, but it was Pedro Warbone. It was Jack Billiam. It was you know, where Don Gullett, some of the, one of the greatest athletes I've ever been around, and, and Gary Nolan, and, you know, whether it be Pat Zachary. Uh, it didn't matter. These guys were every were just as important as, because they put that uniform on that said Reds, and they were the ones that we relied on. And we led the league in the ERA, I think, in 75 and 76 when we won the World Series. Wow. This is such great stuff. Like, can you can you touch on a couple of the guys? Because – 
what I loved about you, Johnny, was like you went to the post every day and like you talking about the leadership role of like controlling that clubhouse. Because like I think not enough players nowadays police the clubhouses. And I think, you know, that's a big deal. I know when you're in the clubhouse, you need those leaders. Regardless of some of the off the field stuff, can you talk about Pete Rose and his play on the field? What what did you love about his play and what, what was so great about him as a teammate? Well, I think the way he approached the game every day, this this was it. this was his. I mean, this was his his morning, noon, and night. This was everything to him. He was a guy that was barely drafted, was only given a tryout by an uncle who had as a scout and who was undersized and everything else, who made himself into what it was. He wanted to be the first hundred thousand dollar single hitter. He wanted to drive a Cadillac. He was, you know, he was so driven by goals, and that was fine because. Every day he went out there was another chance for him to get four hits. It was it was just it just thing. So he did everything. He set the table for us. He played five different positions. It was just he was there. He was it didn't matter. He didn't say I'm Pete Rose. Wait a minute, you don't take me off second base. And then when it was then when he was playing left field, and and Sparky said we traded for George Foster. You need to play third base. Okay. <laughs> And, and you know, he, it didn't matter. He dug his, you know, dug everything in the dirt, put dirt on his hand, rubbed his hands, and just went over to the third base. And he didn't have the greatest arm, but he fielded it. And he, he could get it over there, and we got thing. And then all it does was it made made us a totally better team. He had Kadavy, and we had Gold Gloves and Joe, and then we Cesar Geronimo, who was about as good as they ever got. But so it was. Uh, but every one of them was treated with, you know, the great eight. The big four. Uh, yeah. I mean, I still go all over the country and people come up and say, God, I hated you guys. I was a Cub fan or I was a Dodger fan, but boy, we respected you. And can I tell you the, can let me give you the lineup and they will go right down the lineup. And how wow. many things can ever be in greater in life than to have the respect of the baseball fan themselves for the way you approached and, and the way, you, uh, the way you played the game. Man, I got the chills, man. This is so great. One of the greatest moments of my life, 2012, when I went in and got the, I got the, uh, here, I got it right here. I got it right here. The red, the red, the red jacket. The red jacket wow. going into the, going into the Reds Hall of Fame. Like this means so much to me, and, and and it really does. And Johnny, like for me, going in that time, you were, you know, it was so obvious. You were the leader of the pack. Like what, what Johnny Bench. You you ran the show, and it was like so cool for me to see. And I'll never forget the the breakfast we had that morning, and and it was just for the the Hall of Fame players. And I dude, I get the chills talking about it. But it was you, it was Joe Morgan, it was Tommy Helms, it was Lee May, it was Concepcion, it was uh, I was uh, Eric Davis, Lark. But you and Joe held court, and I was just, I remember I remember writing the stories down. And Lee May's like, "What are you doing, Case?" I'm like. I'm writing these stories down so I don't forget them. This is unbelievable. I remember. You know, it's phenomenal. Re- but the one the one story, Johnny, you told that I just would love to hear it again is the Doc Ellis story when 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 he was just pelting everybody. Can you take us back to that game when you faced the Pirates? It was a big rivalry. And what happened with Doc Ellis? Well, he thought it – well, he wondered what it would be to like to pitch on LSD. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he told her, I guess he told everybody he was going to hit everybody in the lineup. And so he hit the first three guys. He missed me twice. And they went out and took him out. I mean, oh. it was just one of those things where I, and they, and you know, the rivalry was there, obviously. Uh, right. it's, it was an amazing thing about, you know, uh, what it was. But I mean, yeah, there were, there were so many occasions for all of us. And, and, uh, but there's, there's a situation where, you know, when you believe in yourself so much and you and you know you can do things so much that, you know, we lost in 70 to the Orioles. We lost in 72 to the A's. If we lose, if we lose in 75, we're just the Buffalo Bills. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're you know, okay, it's a good team. Big red machine in my rear. And, you know, it's like, uh, but uh, we were blessed in it and we had, you know, Sparky Anderson uh, was respected so much. You know, the difference in a good manager and a great manager, a good manager will convince, uh, tell the cat, uh, convince the good cat, tell the 
I'll tell there's more than one. Oh, tell, yeah, a good manager will tell you there's more than one way to skin a cat. A great manager will convince the cat that it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> and we respected him so much. And then once you had him managing and what he was doing, he would he would make decisions that were two or three innings ahead of everybody else. And he knew people and how to punch buttons. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, we you know, he, he went to the Tigers after Dick Wagner came over. And, uh, you know, it was a great loss for all of us. When you go back to that, and, and, I, and I, when I think back to all the championships you had, especially 75, 76, when you look at Sparky and, 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 and the leader that he was, what did he tell you guys after game six when, when Fisk hit that home run to tie the series? And, you know, we all know, we all have, you know, the, the, the vision of that. And then the, the Reds come back. You guys won game seven. I don't know. Some people didn't even know. I think the Reds won game seven. Did Sparky say something to you guys after that game six in Boston? As I recall, Sparky was so depressed. And Pete went up to him, put his arm around him, and says, don't worry, Spark. This is the greatest series ever. We're going to win game seven, so don't worry about it. And, <laughs> and you know, we go down three to one. Doggy hits the home run against Bill Lee. And, uh, and then Joe gets the base hit. It's, you know, it was just kismet. It should have been. And as you're right, Boston still thinks they won that World Series three games to four. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. So crazy. Um, so we do, we do this thing, Johnny, on, on, my, on my show. It's, it's called 9 and 90. It's, it's a minute, 30 seconds. Chinch has, some, Chinch has some things. And then we just, you know, it's, I don't know the answers. And obviously, neither do you. But it's just kind of a fun um, so uh, you you gonna... think it's fun? I mean, if people had a lot of fun with this, we try. I think so. We, Why? We because won. how great are we? How great are we? We thought of this whole thing and it just came up and, and it just blows oh, your no. mind. I mean. Exactly. We thought it was so All right, cool here's to the, do it. Here's the, here's the answer. Saskatchewan Timbuktu. What's the question? Hmm. Where is Saskatchewan and Timbuktu? <laughs> no, that was the answer. The question is, what was the score? Of the Saskatch Timbuk game. What was this? <laughs> this question. Tim Buck. Buck. You're, you're not dealing with the brightest people here. Oh, I know that. I had to see out of your. I can imagine this game right now. If this game. The, the answer is Saskatchewan Timbuk. The question is, what was the score of the Saskatch Timbuk game? Oh, oh, okay. yeah. oh now I got it. Boy, this is gonna be a, this game's got to be a lot easier now that I'm. All right, about it. it is. It really is. Are you ready? Are you ready, Sean? Okay. I'm not gonna ruin yes. the enemies. All right, so Sean will answer first, and then you can just pick it up right after. This first question will show you the level of uh, how difficult. Wait the a minute, are Rich. Be. You're oh. you're tenuous. Okay, you're temporary. <laughs> Remember, you better make us look good, or your gas is gone. All right. Okay, right. okay, I'll do my best. All right, you ready? All right. First question. John first, lasagna or tacos? Ah, uh, tacos. I love tacos. Tacos. Okay, who wins in a fight? The '90s Reds or the Big Red Machine? Big Red Machine. <laughs> it's fight. Yeah. No, we're we're. I'm very passive. <laughs> okay. Fast one. All right, you can only listen to one of these crooners for the rest of your life. Is it Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra? Hey, Frank Sinatra. Dean Martin. All right, you're on That's the morning, baby. That's the morning. <laughs> yeah. you know, I spent Christmas Eve night with uh, Frank Sinatra, so I knew you have to say Frank Sinatra, obviously. Ah. Uh, they, nobody gives credit enough to Dean Martin, but Frank was so special. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, Case, you are Is on that vacation. It? No, no, no. We still no, go. No, we no, got a few no. more. <laughs> Sorry. You're That's on fun. vacation. Are you at the pool Christmas. or the <laughs> – Are you at the pool or the beach, Sean? I'm at the beach. Okay. I hate the beach pool, and I'd probably be out golfing, so I wouldn't either one of them. You know, if the kids were at the pool, if the kids were at the pool, yeah, I'd be at the pool. But no, nah, either one, I, you know, I got enough sun pulling cotton, so thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, you have to do one of these skydive or great white shark fishing, Sean. Oh, oh, and do I have to get in with the sharks, or can I do it off? A no, boat? he said fishing. He said fishing. Yeah. He didn't say diving. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Let's I'll just great white shark fish. I'll do I'll do great white shark fishing. Okay. Yeah, anytime you're fishing, you're all right. You know, and I 
What I would do is I would skydive just to tell, tell Sean where the fish were. <laughs> I'd go right over the top of it. Perfect. All right. Better, act, better actor, Tom Hanks or Al Pacino, Sean? Oh, Al Pacino. Just love Al Pacino. <laughs> Tom Hanks. Ooh, ooh, interesting, Johnny. Well, I mean, he played so many different things. You know, Al, what the Al's going to do? You know, he got a deal. Al's going to be okay. You know, here's, here's Hanks in the Philadelphia story. He's stranded on an island. He's got the freaking volleyball. Wilson, I mean, what the heck? What are you going to do? Now, and the, and, and the, what was the word where he played the piano and the thing, and then he did the thing? Big. big. Oh, big, big. big. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. All right, good. All right, better made-up name, Sean. Sean Bench or Johnny Casey? Uh, I think Johnny Casey would be a really cool dude. I think Johnny Casey would be really, just an awesome dude. I, I agree. I agree. We would right now be on the Opry right now. I'm telling you. We'd be, we'd be, in, we'd be in Nashville. Uh, I went, I, went to see, I, went to be, I went to see Brad Paisley the other night, man. He's got some serious stuff. And Toby and Garth. Oh, my God. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Right. Johnny Casey, that's good. All right, two more left. True or false, the cell phone is the demise of the human race. Uh, you know what? If it's used wrong, I believe it is, but I think there's so many positive things on the cell phone, too. So, no. Okay. Oh, yeah, FaceTime, baby. FaceTime. Yeah. woo -hoo. Yeah, yeah, FaceTime. All right. Last question. I mean, Here I, we go. How can I be talking to you? How could That's I be, true. which may be the demise of me right now, <laughs> is being on my cell phone, yeah. <laughs> All right, last question, and I didn't change this. This makes it brings everything full circle. In their primes, who wins in a race? Sean Casey or Johnny Bench? 60-yarder. I mean, I stole four bases one year, Johnny. I know you said you stole 25 in a row. I did steal four in 2004, dominating. So, You know what? It and for the first time in my life, I think I might outrun one guy. <laughs> he spent a lot of times because either way, they timed us with a calendar. So it really didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, man. Johnny, dude, you are the greatest. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Like, I have so many freaking questions. Like, you know, we, we could probably keep you another seven hours, but maybe down the road we'll do it again. But. I appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to, to being out there when Marty Marty goes in in a couple of weeks and seeing you out there. We're really quick. I got one last question. Like, I know you're in Cooperstown. I know your buddies with Dean Martin, Arnold Palmer, all these freaking stars, right? Can you talk about a little bit about like the Reds Hall of Fame? Like, like I said, when I go there and and I see the pride that you have and, and you have with especially the Reds fans and what they've meant. Like, can you just talk about the Reds Hall of Fame and what that means to you? No. It's all of fame is the players. There's no other, there was no other thing. My admiration for every one of those guys that got nominated, got elected into that hall of fame. I mean, the respect that you have to give them. I mean, it's not easy, man. It is a hard game. You know, there's only 725 or 35 people in the whole world that play major league baseball. And there's only people that are graced the, the red uniform, you know, but to see my friends who I've, acquaintances, new guys, guys that I've followed and respected, guys that have earned the right. And when you when you get inducted into the Hall of Fame, it is a it is an unbelievable honor. It, it really is. And for guys like you who gave so much to the to the team, uh, you know, I the city itself, great, but we're the ones on the field. Uh the credit belongs to the man actually in the arena. And so when when you're in that arena and you've given up that blood, sweat, and tears, and you've you've given everything you can, you're doing it for the pride that you have within you. So when you are putting on a red jacket, uh, it's to see Wayne Granger and and to see guys that throughout the years, uh, friends of mine, uh, kids I watched great later when I was broadcasting. It's a it's a it's an honor. It's an honor. First of all, I feel so much pride in them. You know, my stats were going to get me in. But to see somebody that really was recognized as a player who contributed to the Cincinnati baseball uh, means a whole lot. And to watch the way they feel about it is really, you know, special. To see Tommy Helms and to see these guys and Jack Billingham and, and guys that truly are good, good people. I mean, they are they are good people, and, and they and that will always stay with me. So... You know, I, I talk to a lot of them still and uh, make my phone calls and check on guys just to make sure they're all right and doing okay. And um, 
it's it's an honor and but it's one that you know when you it's like getting a blue ribbon in 4-H you know you you really did well but to have recognition you know you can't hold your happiness in the hands of others you can't wait for them to applaud or clap for you because they're you know greater and lesser people than all of us and so but to have that night when we have everybody appreciate the fact that who you are what you are give you the recognition that you deserve uh I, I love to hear the applause for those guys because they didn't distinguish themselves into the Baseball Hall of Fame. They didn't distinguish themselves all of this, and they're not nationally recognized and everything else. But but for them to know that what pride that the, the people of, of that city have in them and respect the fact that they were our they were our heroes. And, you know, I was one generation's. You know, Sean, you came along, Johnny Casey, you came out, or Sean Casey, Sean Bench came along later and <laughs> and did his thing and brought. And so what, what is, we sometimes miss is the fact that there will be people sitting out there and they will be nudging their son or they'll talk mm-hmm. to their dad. They remember them to remember this and then he did this and he did that. And they, they, are, they feel good about themselves as well. So the fan really enjoys as much the people that will be there that night. And so when, you know, you walk up there, you have been and always will want to be there, one of their all-time favorites, and, and you deserve it. So, um. I, Dude, I just, I just want to say, for real, like my dad always told me growing up, treat people the way you want to be treated. I want to tell you, man, for, for guys like me, that the Reds Hall of Fame was their, was their pinnacle. And, you know, we, we, I wasn't good enough to be in Cooperstown where, where you guys are. The way you treat me. And the way you treat the, the guys that come in when we look up to, you know, the, 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 you and Joe and all the unbelievable players that have played in, in Cincinnati, I can't thank you enough. That night that I went in in 2012 and every year I've come back is always special. So, my friend, I, I really appreciate that. I always look forward to seeing you, and I can't wait to see you in a couple weeks in August. And thanks so much for joining us today, Johnny. Really, really well, you're welcome. And so you'll bring the parting gifts with you to Cincinnati? or I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah, I mean, you know, I thought you picked up the papers to say it to being on the show. You get, you know, we were, we were glad to give you this watch or some kind of memento or anything else. Hey, I we're guess that's not going to happen. Hey, we're not oh, we're late. Late. oh, my God, we got to take a break here. I'm, oh, my God, we're too late for a commercial now. Let's get away. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny, we're not in Puerto Rico. We don't have watches. Rich and I don't even get paid. We don't even, we don't even get paid. We, we just, we're, we're bums right now. You know? <laughs> Well, if you get more than five watchers, I think you get a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you that bonus. I'll get you that bonus when I see you in August. Oh right? uh, yeah, I'll, I'll really, I'll wait for it and look for it. Thanks, guys. All right, John. Thank you Thanks so a lot, much. John. Love Thanks you, brother. See you, see you soon, my man. Thank you. All right, we'll see you. <laughs> oh man, Case. Oh my God, he's the greatest man, isn't it? Wasn't that awesome? One of the greatest ever. I one of the greatest moments of my career, I got to be honest, yeah. and what an honor it was to be there with you who knows him so well. And I mean, oh, my God, I, I'm just so I'm so happy right now. Dude, <laughs> so I'm happy. honestly, honestly, bro, like I know I hold this red jacket up like, yeah, this means the world to me, like, especially when you go back to Cincinnati and all the fans are there and you're giving your speech on the field. But then. You know, you get moments like I was talking about, the moment at breakfast where, yeah. you know, you don't have the red jacket yet. You get it that night. And you're in, the, you're, in the, you're in that breakfast table, and you got Johnny Bench and Joe Morgan, these guys, Concepcion, Tom, Lee May, just telling the story for two hours. I, yeah. I, I wrote down the stories, and, and it was just, like, unbelievable. But the kindness of Johnny to everybody that's there, like, is so welcoming to, to you, and it means so much. And. Like you said, you saw it right there. What a wonderful human being he is. All the things he does for charities and gives back. And yeah. I don't know. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have doesn't. to. And he's a Hall of Famer. He doesn't have to talk to the guy who didn't make the Hall of Fame. And it's just, right, right. He's, wow, he's Johnny what Bench. And, dude, it, it's, that, what a, I mean, what a cool interview. I, I, could, I feel okay. like I could sit here for the next hour and just talk about that interview. So I, I was this, You know, this really was like cool. the first time where you were like, hey, because uh, <laughs> I looked down and I was like, holy crap, we've been talking to him for an hour and three minutes. I thought it was like. <laughs> And I know. It's just, I, know. I mean, thanks. Dude, for he's so good. But well, that's why, man. that's also why he was so popular off the field and in the media because he's yeah. got the gift of gab, man. This guy, yeah. like, what, what great stories he tells. And, you know, he's got the gift of gab, man. And that's why yeah. he's beloved in Cincinnati still. And 
in a, in a baseball Cooperstown. So, Chance, awesome, man. Great job, dude. Like, what, a, what, a great, what a great show that was. And yeah. Just really cool that Johnny came on. And we got to get him on again, though, dude. I got freaking, Yeah, you got uh, – no, there's a whole list I got, here. like, pages of questions I didn't even I know. ask. We, we, have, we have to push the serious questions away to find out with, about Sean Bench and Johnny Casey. <laughs> Oh, that was a good that. question, I will say. I'm glad we got in the nine, the nine and ninety. Yeah. I'm like, we got to get Bench on the nine and ninety. He's not. <laughs> he's not. Bench is no. too cool for the nine and ninety. Who's no. the best one? Oh my god, oh. so great! All right, man. All right, brother. Okay, man. I love you. Love you I'll too. see you next. I'll see you next week. Thanks, thanks sir. Hey, 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 thanks for everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Please keep tuning in to Mayor's Office. You can find us right here, NoFilter.net, to see us live. Uh, you can see us on YouTube. We'll have it up right tomorrow. Cheers, maybe tonight. Yep. Spotify, Apple, everywhere. Come come listen. We're having a good time. Yeah. We're having a great time. We're not getting paid, but we love having Johnny Benches around and getting him laughing. So thanks, everybody. Absolutely. We really appreciate it. We'll see you guys next week. Keep tuning in. Thanks. See you, brother. <laughs>